So joining us now to discuss more is Margaret Huang. She is the president and chief executive officer of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Thanks so much for joining us, Margaret. I think, you know, the thing about yesterday's hearing is we really got an idea of how organized some of the people in that mob were. Certainly there were other people, and we heard from another uh, testimony of people who just got swept up, but definitely there were people who were organized. The Southern Poverty Law Center is working with the select committee to document extremist groups involved in the insurrection. What more can you share with us about what you found out so far? Good morning, Anne-Marie. There were two extremist groups who were active, particularly on that day, although many others, as we heard yesterday, were aligned with them, coordinating and planning with them. But the two groups in particular that we have highlighted are the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. The Proud Boys were the most violent uh, extremist groups we were tracking at that time in 2020. And they have chapters across the country. They continue to be active at the local and state level across the country. The Oath Keepers is an anti-government militia. Uh, and we track anti-government militias as well, not for the same reasons that we track the white supremacist and misogynist groups like the Proud Boys, but because they actually want to overturn the government. And both of these groups played a pivotal role on January 6th, as we heard yesterday from the witnesses. Right, and then we heard from another witness, Stephen Ayers, who was not part of, a, of an organized group, but his testimony was really, really compelling. I wanna play some of that. And when uh, you heard from President Trump that the election was stolen, how did that make you feel? Oh, I was, you know, I was very upset. Um, as were most of his supporters, um, you know, that's basically what got me to come down here. And do you still believe the election was stolen? Not so much now. Um, I got away from all the social media um, when January 6th happened. So he said that he had gone there to participate in the Stop the Steal event. He had no plans on going to the Capitol, but then got swept up when he heard the president speak. What is it about what the former president said that made people believe him so deeply and sort of get swept up in this manner? Well, the other piece we learned yesterday is that the president actually planned his um, uh, his call to action. Mm. Uh, it was not a spontaneous call. It was planned. He thought about the language to use. And his language was very incendiary. He was calling on his supporters to go to the Capitol and to make sure that Mike Pence was, quote, held accountable. And that was a call to action. So you combine that call with the plans and the vanguard efforts of the groups like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers who led the way, who served as the breaching point for the insurrection. People who got swept up, it's easy to see how that happened because that was the intention. That was in fact the plan from the beginning. And he testified even before that, it was some of the stuff that he saw on social media that really sort of got him into this whole frame of mind. And we actually heard some sort of testimony from kind of like a Twitter whistleblower who was really concerned about some of the stuff on social media and was concerned that it would lead to violence. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the role that social media has played in radicalizing, you know, people like Stephen Ayers, who said he was just like a regular family man. There's no question that particularly with the onset of the pandemic, where we saw so many people spending more time isolated, more time online, that social media became a tool for these extremist organizations to recruit and to spread their propaganda. We have been working to try to hold social media uh, companies accountable for their failure to enforce their own policies. There are policies in place on Twitter, on Facebook, on other social media channels, but it, the companies seem to be either unable or unwilling to enforce those policies. And so instead, what you see is millions of people across the country and even around the world have embraced extremist ideologies because of the failure to, to control and manage what is put on social media by various actors. And you know, we've said it before, but uh, when people look at ISIS and, and talk about the ways in which ISIS was able to radicalize people around the world, a lot of these tactics are very, very similar. Um, Margaret, thank you very much.
Thanks, Anne-Marie.